you very much um, for the invitation. It's a, a pleasure and an honour to speak to this audience. Um, I'm going to present myself as a relatively humble clinician giving a, a, a clinical presentation, um, which is a direct contrast to what we've, uh, what we've been hearing. Um, there we go. <coughs> I've done some, doing some consulting for GE, and the other declaration I have to make is I'm an unrepentant um, technophile. This is a uh, now somewhat dated view of, uh, of Christchurch. It's a, it's a nice city. It's on the coast. At this time of year, you could go surfing or skiing, um, and the water temperature is probably a lot warmer than even a few hundred miles down the, down the coast. Um, and there was a half a metre of powder on the mountains in the background um, this weekend. Um, we're a medium-sized hospital, about 30,000 procedures a year, doing most, um, most general things. New Zealand's a fair way from, uh, from anywhere. Um, mind you, it's only as far from San Francisco as, as most of Europe. Um, but we're in the middle of the South Pacific. We're surrounded by a whole lot of blue stuff. There's a big blob of white stuff down the bottom, and there's some red stuff off to the right-hand side. Uh, and there's San Francisco. Interestingly, the whole western seaboard of the Americas is essentially uh, scattered around the, um, that right, the right-hand side of that hemisphere, and you've got a lot of uh, Southeast Asia. <coughs> Excuse me. And the coast of, uh, coast of China on the left. Um, just a bit of background, uh, as much about me as about what I'm going to talk about. We've had Navigator prototypes for five years or so. Um, we got to play with Smart Pilot View uh, in a slightly earlier version than you'll see out there, uh, about three years ago. Since we started uh, re-equipping our fleet with GE machines, we haven't seen much of the uh, Smart Pilot View. Um, Essentially, they do much the same job. There are some slight differences in, in, in the implementations and, and the presentations. But you can take much of what I'm going to say and, and apply the same logic to the smart pilot um, view. Um, so <coughs> how did we end up in our little corner of the South Pacific with this, uh, with this technology? What does it do? What can you do with it? And I think th this is a little bit like TCI, to go back a couple of, a couple of talks and, and John Sears' point. You know, th this is a whole lot of technology uh, and ideas that has been put together by a lot of people uh, in, in the room. Uh, it's been around for re various components of it have been around for various lengths of time. But what we've got now with these commercial packages is something that we can take off the shelf and, and use all these uh, great ideas. This is a uh, slide from a presentation I gave in uh, 1989, um, looking at the abstract book. The preceding abstract it was by Kate Leslie. Um, and this is just, I guess, showing my early interest in, in, in pharmacokinetics. And by closing the, by putting propofol in both the burette and, and in a bag, you can achieve the uh, E and the T component of a BET scheme. Um, and we did, you can prove that dextrose does the same thing, and it gives much the same sort of um, curves as, as you get with, with the uh, empirical step regimes that were popular at the time. Um, the problem is, as we heard, this is absolutely hopeless to, uh, to use. The other thing I've been interested in over the years is a concept which I guess we could characterise as inhalational target control. There's a lot of thinking about volatile kinetics, which is, I, now let me put that another way, why do we, exactly what I've got there, why do we think about volatile, the kinetics of volatile agents in a different way from infusions? And in fact, uh, I'd put it to you that we can apply a lot of the same thinking uh, to both sets of drugs. Uh, to some extent, I think that's because a lot of people thought we knew all there was to know about volatile anaesthetics, and let's look at these interesting new drugs. And. TCI pumps, a lot of TCI pumps have a couple of features that as well as providing the constant drug effect, they also display the effect site, which we've heard a little bit about, and forward prediction, uh, which is an incredibly useful tool. So we took the fresh gas flow and the dial settings and the entitle uh, and, and were able to, to build a system which worked in much the same way and gave forward predictions of both effect site uh, and entitle levels of, um, 
of, <coughs> of sevoflurane. Um, and it's a form of manual target control. There is actually a very similar display on the um, Draga Perseus, um, which we've had nothing to do with. Uh, and we've done some work on uh, validating an effect site approach to uh, anaesthesia. Of course, you get all sorts of types of anaesthesia delivery within the one, um, within the one department. There's Wayne Morris, who's very involved in the, in the World Federation. We've heard a little bit. I guess the next thing is we've got these wonderful solutions, but what's the problem they're trying to solve? And we've heard a little bit about it. Um, the kinetics of drugs we use in anaesthesia are complex, but it's not just that the drugs are complicated. We're using them in actually quite a, 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 a challenging setting. If you draw the contrast with a family medicine practitioner organising an a, a, a antihypertensive treatment or a heart failure treatment or anything like that, most of those drugs you just want to get them into the system and working at a constant, at a constant level. And even intensivists and antibiotic dosing is a much more stable problem than the problem we have in anaesthesia. So we ne seldom get to steady state. When we do get to steady state, the requirement changes. Uh, we need to get the drugs off as well as on, and that means that the classic um, drug parameters actually have very little relevance. And then our drugs interact, we've been hearing about that, and all of, the, all of our patients are different. And so the question I put to you is, is one size fits all anaesthesia uh, good enough with the sort of knowledge we're getting about outcomes and the influence of anaesthesia on, on long-term outcomes? So what do these devices offer? You get guided targeting um, for most drugs, and, and this is really, I like to think of it as a form of manual um, target control infusion. They are all based on the effect site. You're not given the choice of whether you want effect site or plasma levels, you just get it. Uh, there are a number of drugs that you can use in these systems which are not available in even the most um, open of, of TCI systems, fentanyl, uh, muscle relaxants, and to some extent the volatiles. And of course, uh, as we've just heard, you see, the, um, you see the interactions. They're also very valuable for showing you um, predictions and, and trends, so you can see where you've come from, see where you're going. This is the, uh, this is the navigator display. There are actually three, uh, inter three applications embedded in it. We're only going to be talking about the so-called therapy uh, one. Uh, across the top is basically the history of your drug dosing with the total doses in the top right-hand corner. Uh, down the uh, right-hand side, here are the uh, current uh, effect, site, effect site levels. There's a whole heap of drugs modelled. There are some important emissions, morphine, atricurium, uh, and the alpha-2 agonists, uh, uh, significant emissions, uh, and also drugs like uh, ketamine. Inputs come from a whole range of infusion pumps, uh, a, a range of, of monitors and anesthesia systems, obviously all GE ones. And you can put data in for both infusions and boluses manually uh, using that um, display in the top right-hand corner. Output comes in three domains. The first is called um, sedation, hypnosis. Uh, the next is analgesia. And then there's, um, and then there's relaxation. <coughs> it's just worth working through the, through the display. The first thing the display shows you is the uh, EC50 for whatever the response uh, 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 that you're talking about is. Uh, then you get the, it's labelled as EC95. It's, it, uh, there are some sort of double negatives in the terminology. It's actually the EC95 for not responding, which is, as Michelle was saying, exactly what we're interested in. And then you see a separation of, of effects. The, the yellow-ish line is the effect of the propofol uh, alone, and the, the black line is the combined effect of propofol and the, uh, in this case, remifentanil. On the likelihood, and remember these are probabilities, of, uh, of, of response, of, of the patient being awake or responding. The same thing applies in the second panel, the analgesic panel. There is the, uh, e the EC50, the EC95. And here we see the individual drug effects. Now this is uh, uh, remifentanil. The green line is remifentanil at a little over five, um, five nanograms per mil, something like 0.2 uh, mics per kilo per minute. And what you see is that the effect of the uh, opioid by itself is actually pretty, pretty minimal. It's not going to blunt your effect to a noxious stimulus much. 
without the synergy that we've heard about. Um, I think, as I've, as I've implied, these are slightly misnamed. They've picked nice, simple words, but sometimes the words themselves convey, bring their own meaning. So I guess what we mean by sedation is the probability of unconsciousness. Analgesia, uh, it's the probability of no response to, to laryngoscopy, and that response in the sort of studies that Michelle was talking about for this data is either movement or a change in pulse or blood pressure by more than 20%. So you pretty much get uh, what uh, it works as advertised. You get calculated effect site levels, uh, <coughs> you get the probabilities thrown graphically, and you get output in these panels, and you can actually overlay BIS values or, or entropy values on, on top of it. Um, and I think you can look at this in, in three different domains. The first. I struggled with this abbreviation. The M for manual, you've got TCI, TC for infusion, but you've got inhalation as well, and I've put a plus in there because somehow it's, it's a whole lot more than, um, than TCI. The interactions, they're really important, uh, but one of the great things about this, and I'll show you some examples uh, in a while, is, is the way it helps us understand what we're actually, um, what we're actually doing. And this is just a list of, of more specific uh, 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 things that you can do with these types of types of system. Manual target controlled infusion uh, is actually, although, although I'm a, a great user of, of TCI when I've got it available, which is most of the time, uh, you can do a lot with a system which simply shows you the uh, consequences and the implications of, of what you're doing, and, and, and these sorts of tools, Navigator Smart Pilot View, allow you to do that. So the user controls the delivery, uh, you can see the trajectory of the drug concentrations, uh, and it also allows us to, to play with new drugs as, um, as I've alluded to. Here's another example. We've got a um, fairly standard manual propofol infusion. Uh, there's a bolus of 120 milligrams, then 80 mils an hour, and stepping down to um, 60 mils an hour. But there's three boluses, and this would be a fairly standard sort of set of boluses of, of fentanyl, and you can start to see the, the trajectory of, of the fentanyl levels over time, and, and even though it's bolus, it's, it, it's still man, a guided bolusing system, and with the relaxant on the bottom. Of course, what happens is that um, I can't, this is some plastic surgery case which was sort of going on a bit as they, as they tend to do. Um, you can see here the um, propofol level, um, just if I can... No, lost my dot. Um, the propofol level stepping down, which is what you get. You get those nice clean depressions with a target controlled infusion. But it was giving a whole lot of boluses of, of, of fentanyl and of relaxant. And after a while, with this sort of technology lying around, you get bored with doing that. So we start some infusions of both um, uh, uh, fentanyl and, and of the, um, and of the relaxant. Um, mixing opioids. Post-op analgesia we need, and of course, as, as we focus more and more on having the patient awake and mobile and all of those sorts of things at the end of, um, end of the surgery, which is quite different from a halothane morphine um, anaesthetic, uh, we need to get them awake and comfortable. There are big differences in how people in different parts of the world achieve this and what mixtures we all, we all use, but, but the basic objectives are still the same. As I've said, we now have some we now have the ability to titrate in a guided fashion drugs we haven't been able to before. Uh, we don't have sufentanil uh, in New Zealand. Um, <coughs> but what you can do is, is quite in quite a controlled way, transition from, from remifentanil to fentanyl, and in fact I'd commonly use um, both, at the, um, both at the same time. What we have found, that graph on the right, is some data we presented here a couple of years ago is that even in relatively unstructured anaesthetics, there's actually quite a good correlation between the amount of opioid you end up giving a patient intraoperatively and their postoperative requirements. So you can actually use the Remy fentanyl to work out how much fentanyl you're going to need and how, and you can see how the patient's going to be when they get to the um, recovery area. Uh, and the net result of this is I often end up using four uh, infusion pumps. 
just a couple more examples. What this leads on to is as we get more experienced in these sorts of things is, is quite a few people in our department, either with or without the navigator, use it what's effectively app-guided fentanyl delivery. Um, there's Thomas Schneider's one on the left and a, a much more expensive uh, version on the right, but they both do the same thing in there. Once you get your head around using effects like guided fentanyl, it uh, becomes an interesting way to um, assist your anaesthetic. Of course, you can go one step further. Um, the iPad down on the right is, is running the demo version of Smart, um, Smart Pilot View. Of course, it's labelled not for clinical um, use, um, but it works and they, they're useful, useful guides. Obviously, you can titrate to effect. Uh, again, we've got the anaesthetist acting as the, as the integrator, if you like, in deciding what the appropriate level this particular patient needs. But you can see we've started off at relatively low levels uh, here and then stepped up once the surgeons were finally uh, interested in the operation. And you can see it in the bottom right, the same thing happening with the relaxant, and it took a couple of steps to find the um, appropriate level. You can adjust to match the stimulus. Um, you can deal with drugs which aren't included in the data set because they essentially provide an offset. And it provides a tool to get to the appropriate level and stay there. And I think if we're talking about these systems or um, uh, TCI in general, this is, a, uh, a, a, I think, a, a wonderful summary of, of the concept. The major strength of a fixate controlled TCI lies not in predicting the resulting hypnotic effect in the individual patient, but rather the ability to maintain a pharmacological condition once a predetermined effect has been reached. And that's very much the advantage of these sorts of situations. Um, this is about an hour and a half um, time case of, a, I think it was a pelvic extenteration, some sort of major surgery. Um, there was a little, a little adjustment of the uh, Remy fentanyl concentration near the beginning of that screen and a slight adjustment of the, um, of the relaxant towards the end. Um, but essentially there's the thick end of a couple of hours of drug delivery with no, um, no direct intervention by, by me. And I think two hours is about my limit. Um, you can use different combinations to achieve the same, the same effect. This is just a, a, a demonstration where the um, propofol has been reduced and the Remy fentanyl has been increased, but what you see is the combined hypnotic effect is staying roughly, roughly constant. And if you model the same thing in the smart pilot view world, what you effectively do is, is doing is sliding down the isobologram, staying at roughly the same, roughly the same level, but shifting from a, a, a high hypnotic mixture to a higher opioid mixture. Talked a little bit about changing drugs of different sorts. You can do the same thing, changing from um, volatile to propofol or, um, or vice versa. And although there is a zone where uh, Navigator doesn't include uh, a, a propofol volatile opioid um, combination and it stops doing the modeling, um, you at least have the forward predictions of the drugs and you can see how one is decreasing as the other increases to keep rough parity and particularly when you combine a, a, a measure of effect, in this case entropy, it makes the whole process a lot smoother. I, um, I struggle to find a word for this concept. I've settled on consensus, but what I'm really talking about here is, is using something like Navigator, a drug display thing, a, as a form of monitoring. Okay, so it's providing yet another perspective on what this particular patient needs, how, much, how you're going to deal with the situations the patient and the surgeon are, um, are throwing at you. And I guess it, it allows a tool to convert what might be a double or a triple low, to use potential jargon, in, into um, a, du a double or, or a single. You can be slightly more confident about some of your drug dosing uh, decisions if you've got this sort of information and can see where the patient is and, and where they're going. Um, as I say, it's especially useful in patients who need more or less than normal. This is just some data of ours on the point at which people, um, people wake up. And I'm really only showing it to you to show that there is an enormous uh, degree of variability. People don't all wake up at, at Mac awake. Um, just again to demonstrate that as you change one thing, the other 
the, the next thing um, changes between the Rumi fentanyl up there. The black line with the red line through it is, is bis. The values are actually upside down, so the, uh, uh, the lower bis values move the, move the value up. So that's just a, a, a demonstration that the combined hypnotic level and the bis seem to move uh, in parallel. Um, if you are not watching what's going on, they can do the same thing. You can see here the propofol hasn't uh, actually changed by much, but the opioid concentration has gradually sunk down, and then when we fix the problem, um, again, the combined hypnotic effect and the entropy move in the, in the same direction. The morning started with uh, discussion on relaxants, and you actually learn all sorts of things about relaxant kinetics as well. One of the things which I find intriguing is that the actual level at which an individual patient responds or, or doesn't respond is very variable, but once you define the point, once you define a, 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 a blood level and a response for the individual patient and return of T2 is a, is, is a good one, it turns out to be remarkably, remarkably constant. And it certainly changed my uh, uh, approach to, uh, to relaxant, um, relaxant delivery. So what can you expect? Rapid, reliable wake-up? Well, yeah, prob probably. Um, actually, it's a, it's a great tool for titrating the endpoints. Um, this paper from the outgoing president said that 90% of patients wake up within minute, one minute of crossing the EC, um, the EC50 line. That allows you, with the uh, predictions, to see what's, um, what's happening into the future. We've been, um, this is very preliminary data, we've been looking at the point that patients, where we think patients wake up, and we're using a slightly different definition. Um, we're finding the median point people wake is about two and a half minutes after they cross the 50% um, line. That's probably quite useful. Um, and that response has an interquartile range of about, of about five minutes. That probably reflects normal, um, normal patient variability. So you can rapidly adjust anesthesia for changing needs. It definitely reduces workload. Um, and the thing about that is it means you're no longer focusing on the detail of when do I need to change the infusion rate, you know, how long has it been running at that rate, what should I choose next, uh, is you can actually concentrate on, on what's going on, the, the, the bigger picture. And TCI in general and automated vapor <laughs> systems have much the same uh, value and then that's been shown with various workload measure studies. It makes it easy to use different techniques, or a lot easier. Most of us, I think, it, most anesthetists seem to generate a single recipe and it's hard to move people from them. These sorts of tools mean if you want to do something else, it's, it's relatively easy. And as patient needs differ, which is a variation of the same thing, um, again, it's easier to adapt. So we're moving, I think, in, in, towards an era of um, bespoke anesthesia. I said I'd finish with some uh, examples of the sort of understanding you can get out of this sort of thing. Um, that line at the bottom for those who can't, I expect you all to be independent, innovative, critical thinkers who will do exactly as I say. Um, and I have the impression that, uh, that some, of the way, some of the way we teach anesthesia is a bit like, a bit like that. And as I say, that leads to this problem that there, we have a lot of people who have learnt to give anesthesia in a particular way and it's very, very hard to move them um, from something, a recipe which works. So here's just a simple simulation of, of induction. It shows you how long a uh, propofol bolus can last. Um, you get a different effect on hypnosis in response to noxious stimulus, and when you've got this thing in the corner and the re resident can't get the laryngeal mask in, and what they want to do is give more and more and more propofol, even though the machine is clearly showing you that they're way, way down on their response to noxious stimulus, and they're busy applying a noxious stimulus, you can explain uh, the logic or illogic of what they are doing. Another interesting one for those of you who, who practice occasional inhalational induction, I personally think it's a useful tool, uh, it, it is this, but it doesn't take long before at least half the people are uh, asleep or unconscious, that's only a couple of minutes. Um, you get, but it's twice as long before half of them, only half of them are unresponsive to a noxious stimulus. And in this particular um, case, it was probably three times the time it took from starting delivery of anesthesia to the patient becoming uh, unconscious to the point at which they were 
deep enough to use an awful word that you could put around your mask in. So patients go to sleep long before there's no response to noxious stimulus. Um, why you need to wait before you do something nasty to them. And the other thing this, this shows is that once you've got them asleep, once you've got IV access, if you give what would have been a standard dose of fentanyl, uh, it also explains how potent uh, that extra dose is and uh, if you're not careful why the blood pressure goes away. So we've got these various uh, effects and you can illustrate, um, illustrate where um, these various levels um, are. And again, this is a fairly standard uh, volatile anaesthetic. Well, accent kinetics, I've, I've, I've talked about, and you learn a lot. Uh, it's interesting to find myself commonly infusing relaxants. It's a thing when I was starting, I thought only um, the, the practitioners whose practice was sort of slightly out there on the extreme um, did, and I find myself joining the group. Everything has limitations. There are only three pumps. Um, Navigator has a time-based display. I think there is some, there is some value in the, in the isobologram. Um, the inhalational forward predictions are not as good as those for IV drugs because it's based uh, on the, uh, only on the entitled measures. Um, the interaction of propofol, volatile, and opioid is, is still missing. You can't see the opioid levels and the uh, analgesic effect uh, at the same time, and there is something really weird about the way our fentanyl is, is scaled. And not all the drugs are, 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 more, are included in the interaction modelling. Having said all that, it's a great demonstration of what's going on. Uh, excellent teaching tool. You can learn things by using it that you can then apply in, in, in other settings. I think it's great for learning to adapt your own anaesthetic um, technique to deal with interpatient variability. Uh, certainly, despite my early foray into intravenous anaesthesia and uh, we had TCI pumps from about 1996, it's really only in the last two or three years and having tools like this that I've really been able to give a half decent um, TIVA anaesthetic. So I think it's an even bigger step forward than target controlled infusion. Um, I won't say that those of you who don't have TCI don't know what you're missing. Um, the kinetics of drugs we use are almost never at, at equilibrium uh, and that really goes